Hello everyone, you're watching the channel Stories of Our Life. Friends, make yourselves comfortable. I wish you to truly enjoy listening to this life story. Josiah walked out of the marriage registry office and breathed in some fresh air. That was it, he was free now. Only did he need that freedom? The man slowly raised his head and looked up into the sky. The peace that hung as a blue spot between the high-rise buildings, yes, there in the sky, freedom. And here, cars, houses, hustle and bustle. You're in a hurry, you're running somewhere. It's all the eternal chasing of your lady fortune. So he was running all the time. He ran and did not notice how the most important thing, love, was gone from his life. And was it there now? He didn't even know anymore. No, and now he was not free, but alone. He and Kayla met at some party. He was an aspiring businessman, she was an aspiring actress. There was an immediate spark between them. Then there was a wedding at one of the best restaurants in their city six months later. Josiah may have wanted something simpler, but could he tell that to his beloved? Kayla was waiting for a fairy tale, and she got it. Then family life began. Of course, Josiah imagined it a little differently. He wanted his wife waiting at home, dinner on the table and all that. But it turned out differently. Kayla was out till night at the theater, on weekends she was somewhere with her bohemian hangout. Josiah didn't have a hot dinner or a warm bed. She used to say in response to all her husband's reproaches, I have to find a producer. There is no other way in our profession. You cannot pay me for the main role. They had scolding and scandals, but Josiah too loved his spoiled girl, so he continued to endure. There were also vanity notes playing at heart. When he appeared at dinner parties with his beautiful wife, all the guests simply dropped their jaws. Yeah, that's his wife. A few years later. Josiah was firmly on his feet in a few years. He was able to expand the business, find partners and investors. His construction company was now the most famous in town. Now Kayla didn't have to look for producers. Josiah could pay for everything himself. And he paid, and Kayla shined in the theater. A few times she even starred in some TV soap operas. His wife was happy. And Josiah was happy, but something was missing. They had moved into their mansion by then. They had a full staff of servants and lots of money. But there was still something missing. Josiah realized that what was missing was children. In the beginning Kayla found good reasoning, while I'm young, I need to play more roles to be remembered. Kids? Well, a little later, definitely. She kept putting it off and putting it off. Josiah agreed with her at first, but then there was a slight bewilderment, well, how long has it been? It's been 10 years. The bewilderment turned first to displeasure and then to anger, my wife doesn't want kids at all? The scandals began to happen more and more often. And one day Josiah gave an ultimatum either a child or a divorce. Kayla agreed, but it didn't work out. And that's when they went to the clinic. And the doctors just threw up their hands. Kayla couldn't get pregnant at all. She had an abortion when she was young. She got pregnant by her classmate. She admitted to Josiah only after the doctor's verdict. Josiah felt betrayed. He had waited so many years, hoped. And then there was this. He didn't blame Kayla, no. Well, she'd done something stupid in her youth, so what now? She should have told him sooner, because medicine had moved forward. He kept on hoping. They were advised to go to an IVF specialist. There they had hope. Josiah rejoiced about it. And Kayla only pretended to be happy, though she was often thoughtful. She was the first to talk about a surrogate mother. Josiah didn't want to hear it at first, but Kayla convinced him again. Honey, you understand, if I have this kind of problem, will I carry our baby after IVF? The doctors themselves say there's a 50% chance of pregnancy. I would have to go through excruciating procedures, drink hormones. It might not work, and I'll get fat and ugly. Not to mention the fact that I'd have to give up my profession. 
but you'll stop loving me, too. I'll always like you, Josiah assured her. Honey, you talk like that now, and when I'm under 100 pounds, you'll talk differently. Josiah agreed. No, he wasn't intimidated by the prospect of his wife's unpleasant transformation. He didn't believe that would be the case. He just didn't want his beloved to be tortured by drugs and procedures. They spent a long time choosing a surrogate mother and eventually found a young girl. Olive was from the countryside. She worked in town as a hairdresser. She had a daughter growing up, who she gave birth to by a classmate six months after graduation. They wanted to get married, but they didn't make it. He went off to serve. She promised to wait for him. When she gave birth to her daughter Maya, the news came that her lover had died in a hot spot. His mother raised him alone. She died a week after the terrible news. Olive, too, counted only on her mother. His father had long since abandoned them and gone to an unknown place. When Maya was three years old, doctors set a terrible diagnosis. She was found to have a serious heart defect. With such a disease, only live up to 10 years, unless an operation is performed. One could wait years for a free operation, and an urgent operation would require a lot of money. That's certainly not something you can make in your village. She could hardly do it in the city either, but Olive looked for ways and found it, she decided to become a surrogate mother. She honestly told Josiah about her situation. He got into the story and paid the money right away. It wasn't by the book. Olive was very grateful to him. Her daughter underwent surgery. Maya remained in her grandmother's care, and Olive moved into Josiah and Kayla's mansion. She faithfully honored the terms of her contract. Pregnancy went easily. Olive was going to have a boy. Olive followed her doctor's orders responsibly. She took walks, drank vitamins, listened to classical music. In the evenings Josiah was interested in her affairs in the evening, and Olive gladly talked about the day's events. Kayla was also sometimes present during these conversations, but she was clearly not interested. She was in her own thoughts. Kayla was thinking about a new production, a new script. She became kind of thoughtful and even angry as time went on. She was annoyed by Olive's talk about vitamins, hemoglobin, oxygen levels, fetal heartbeat. Kayla tried to shift all of Josiah's attention to herself. Why are you picking on the girl? Let her get more rest. She told him softly, kissing him on the cheek and drawing him away. Nothing foretold trouble, but she appeared to be close at hand. That time Josiah left for a new construction site in the next town. Kayla called toward evening. He didn't immediately realize what had happened through her tears. And when he understood what had happened it turned cold inside him with horror and grief. Olive was gone. A day later, when Josiah returned home irritated and confused, the police called them. They found a burned-out car outside of town, the same license plate number Olive had driven away in. In the interior was the charred corpse of a pregnant woman. No one could figure out what had happened. There was no doubt that it was Olive. The blood type matched, the police found a purse with a burnt passport. Yes, it was Olive. Josiah was devastated. How much hope he had associated with the birth of the child this unfortunate girl was to bear and give birth to. And then such a misfortune occurred. A funeral had to be made. As luck would have it, Josiah's urgent presence at a site in a nearby town was required. Kayla convinced him to go. She promised to take care of all the arrangements for the delivery of the body to Olive's hometown. Josiah was so grateful to his wife, how she's holding up. Good for her. He left after making sure the police were on the case. He returned a week later. Their mansion was now empty and lonely. During this time Josiah had become very attached to Olive. Yes, he missed that sweet girl with the growing belly. Josiah himself did not understand what it was. Probably, just like a father-to-be, he was anxiously awaiting the arrival of his miracle. But he didn't wait. Kayla was surprisingly calm. She was only upset that so much money had been wasted. Not in vain. We helped Olive's daughter. Though it's scary to imagine what it cost, 
Josiah told her at the time. Oh, you've gotten so sentimental. Come on, let's just forget the whole thing like a bad dream, Kayla grinned. And Josiah agreed. Moreover, the details of that terrible story never emerged. The police filed the unsolved case. Time passed. It took three years for him to dare to talk about IVF again. Once again, Kayla resisted. And Josiah convinced her. Age was no laughing matter. He's in his forties, she's in her forties. It's time. This time for sure it has to work out. Only now they won't let their surrogate mother go anywhere alone. There's no telling what would have happened had Josiah not caught Kayla in their bed with her young lover, her driver, who he hired. At first Kayla cried and swore it was a one-time thing, that she loved Josiah. And then that same driver confessed that she had been sleeping with his wife for six months. And before that, she had an affair with a director. And before that, she had an affair with a stage colleague. And before that. Don't mention it. The most frustrating thing is that he didn't notice anything. How so? He could no longer live with this woman. What children? Josiah did not forgive betrayal, so he filed for divorce. No, he did not leave Kayla with one suitcase. He gave her some of his possessions. She will not need anything. But he can't see her anymore. Yes, much has been lived and much has been experienced, but how many lies, it turns out, have been told. And Kayla, realizing that she is a very wealthy lady, was not at all saddened by the divorce. Now she is free, nice, rich, and she doesn't have to have children. And so, two years passed after the divorce. Josiah lived alone. Women are not allowed to him. Many beautiful women sighed sadly, looking at the wealthy good-looking man. He devoted himself to his work. Something had changed in his character. The previously good-natured, understanding boss was now rude. He had become tough, principled, demanding. He had been shot right in the heart, and it was icy. Everything in his office was supposed to run like clockwork, and no one had the right to disrupt that work. The employees in the office were afraid to be a minute late in the morning, and they didn't stay late for lunch. Needless to say, reports and projects were handed in strictly according to schedule. Ariel worked for Josiah as a secretary. She knew him from before. The dramatic change really surprised her, but she had to comply with the new requirements. It was very hardy though. Ariel had a daughter, Tilly, growing up. She was in kindergarten kindergarten. Until two years ago, Ariel could sometimes bring her daughter to work with her when the daycare center was on quarantine and her husband was away on business. Now she had to find other solutions. Josiah imposed a strict rule, no outsiders allowed, much less children. This addition applied specifically to Ariel. The boss was paying enough money, so to break this rule was the height of insanity. But that day it all went wrong. Josiah's receptionist called from the front door and asked Katya to come down. She saw a young woman and a little boy about five years old. The woman was so thin that Ariel involuntarily thought she was sick. Excuse me, are you Josiah's secretary, the stranger said timidly. Yes, Ariel nodded and stared at the woman. Please take the boy to him, the woman's voice trembled. She wiped away a tear that had come up and cradled the child frantically in her arms. Then she uncrossed her arms and gently nudged him to Katya, that's his son. Son? Ariel's eyebrows stopped somewhere near the middle of her forehead. But. It's his son, the stranger interrupted her and held out the envelope, take it. Give it to him. He'll read it and understand, she lowered her eyes, then abruptly threw herself at the boy, embraced him, kissed him, and rushed away toward the exit. The boy was about to run after her, but then as if he remembered, he turned back to Ariel. Auntie, take me to my dad, he said, and timidly held out his skinny little hand. Well, let's go, Ariel replied confusedly, looking after the fleeing woman. She twirled the envelope, shrugged. Ariel, should we call the police, the security guard, who had heard the whole conversation, called out to her. 
Let Josiah decide that, the girl replied, looking thoughtfully at the child. She caught herself thinking that the baby did look a lot like her boss. Ariel took the boy by the hand. They headed for the elevator. How I want to see the boss's confused face, Ariel grinned a little gloatingly to herself, you can't take children to work. Here's a present for you. In the waiting room, Ariel set the boy down on the visitor's couch, gave him a pen and a piece of paper. The child looked upset, holding back from crying with all his might. Apparently, the unexpected departure of his mother had really upset him. He held on. What's your name, baby, asked Ariel and stroked the boy's head. Declan, he whispered faintly. What a nice name you have, the secretary smiled, and then pulled a candy from her pocket, there you go, that's for you. Thank you, the boy said just as quietly, took the candy, unwrapped the wrapper, ate it, and looked around for an urn to throw away the wrapper. Give it to me, Ariel held out her hand, noting how well-mannered the boy was. Ariel went about her business, constantly thinking to herself and occasionally glancing in Declan's direction, I wonder how it is that our crystal-clear boss could make a child out of wedlock? The baby is about five years old, like my daughter. So Josiah was married then. And then he divorced his wife because she betrayed him and cheated on him. And himself? Josiah's good, too. That girl in the lobby, she was a mouse. And how did the boss look at her? After all, Kayla, his wife, was a thousand times more interesting. At the same time, Declan was painstakingly scribbling something on a piece of paper. Ariel was deftly tapping on the keys of the keyboard. Everyone was busy doing his own thing. When the door to the reception opened, the woman and the boy turned their heads at the same time. Ariel blushed slightly when she saw Josiah, as if he might have overheard her thoughts. Declan startled and froze at the sight of the unfamiliar uncle. Josiah shifted his gaze from Ariel to the boy in surprise. His eyebrows crept upward. What does that mean, he finally said rather stiffly, Ariel, you know that children are not allowed in our office, and if you have no one to leave your child with, we will have to say, goodbye. Ariel, hearing such words, only smiled and shrugged. Josiah, it's not my baby. Especially, I have a girl. Then whose is it? The woman who called me down said it was yours. Hearing this, Josiah looked at Ariel with a surprised look. Mine? What nonsense. She left an envelope, told you to read it. Ariel held out the envelope, inwardly rejoicing. She had certainly treated her boss well, but lately he had become like a soulless machine. Josiah took the envelope, looking visibly worriedly at the boy. Something twitched in his face. He noticed, too, that the little boy looked exactly the same as he did in the baby pictures. Or was he confused and did all children look alike in some way? Okay, let him sit there. I'll be right back, Josiah jerked open the door to the study and, as if apologizing, repeated, I'll be right back. The door shut behind him. Ariel smiled at Declan, who was clearly startled. Why is uncle slamming doors? It's all right, kid. It'll be all right, the woman winked. She really wanted to ask the boy where his mother had gone, but she was afraid he would cry. It was none of her business. Let the boss sort it out himself and look for Declan's mother. Josiah sat back in his chair with a swing, turned the envelope. What was this nonsense? He finally opened the envelope, unfolded the sheet. His eyes ran quickly over the smooth neat letters. From the first lines he was literally numb to what he was reading. As he read further, he thought he was going crazy. Hello, Josea. I'm sorry I didn't meet you in person, I can't. Yes, you did wrong then, but I should have been grateful to you, because you saved my daughter by paying for the surgery. But I couldn't give you my son. Not when I found out. I think you know what I mean. I'm sorry. I thought I could raise and raise two children on my own, I was even good at it, but the damn disease. I'm probably going to die soon. Maya will be taken care of by my mother. She's old now, and I'm afraid Declan might be taken to an orphanage after I die, so I'm giving him to you. Declan is your son. 
Don't doubt it. You can have his DNA tested. Please raise him to be a decent human being. Olive. Josiah read to the end and his forehead was covered in a slight sweat. This is some kind of monstrous spectacle. Olive was the same girl who five years ago was supposed to give birth to his and Kayla's son. But she's dead. He saw the case file in the morgue himself. He and Kayla identified her by some things, blood type, gestational age, everything matched, and then this. No, someone decided to play a cruel joke on him, or this is someone's scam. Josiah was already reaching for the phone to call the police, but suddenly his hand froze. What if it was true? Just then Olive ran away, faking her own death. But who was helping her? She couldn't have done it alone. And what could she have found out about? What could she have known that he should know? The man looked questioningly at the door. There was a little boy sitting in the waiting room who really looked like him. Josiah could definitely see that. How was that possible? In any case, there were more questions than answers. Something had to be decided. Yes, the DNA procedure would answer the big question. He went out into the waiting room and walked over to the boy and sat down on the couch. The little boy looked up frightened. Are you my daddy, he whispered softly. Josiah shrugged his shoulders. He didn't know how to answer the child. So your name is Declan? Where's your mother? She, she, the boy sobbed, she left. Mom said she had to go to the hospital, and in the meantime I'll stay with you. Mom said to behave and not to cry. And what's your mother's name? Olive, at which point the child broke down and cried. Josiah unknowingly put his arm around the boy, stroking his head. What's the matter, he asked confusedly, everything will be all right. Let's go to my place now, and then we'll decide what to do. Ariel watched silently from the sidelines and only wondered. The boss, such a dry and stern man, suddenly spoke so kindly, so humanly. This was her old boss as she had known him before. After making the necessary arrangements, Josiah and Declan left the office, leaving the staff only to wonder who the boy was. No one expected that boss could conceive a son on the side. And no one even remembered the surrogate mother. Few people knew about it, though. Before starting the proceedings, Josiah decided to find out if the child was his. He and the boy stopped by the clinic for a DNA test. We'll have the result in 10 days, the nice girl lab technician said. In 10 days, Josiah was unpleasantly surprised. Yes. There's no way it can be sooner. That meant 10 days to live in suspense. Maybe I should turn the kid over to the orphanage. Let them handle it. What if his mother was the Olive? No, we'd have to find out for ourselves. The mansion was surprised to see the owner so early, and with the child. Josiah, has something happened, the maid Sky asked timidly. Something's happened, Josiah sighed, I don't know what it is yet myself. You feed the boy, keep him busy, and I have some things to find out. Skye didn't ask any more questions, just nodded her head. Josiah went into the study, found some old papers. Among them should have been a copy of the passport of that olive girl. That's right, it was there. Josiah looked up the registration in some village. Wow, that must have taken 24 hours to get there. But before he went looking for olive, he went to the police. He had to find out the details of that unsolved case, who had really been found. He was sure Olive was dead. True, Kayla had been more involved with the police at the time. He just had an urgent job to do. The investigator listened to Josiah and raised his eyebrows in surprise. I was on the case then, and I remember it well. Yes, you identified the corpse as Olive. But then new details came to light, the investigator said that Olive was then found alive and well in the village. She had just applied for a lost passport, we called your spouse. We couldn't reach you. She said she'd tell you. She hasn't passed on anything yet, Josiah shook his head, and I've been so busy. No, I called you later and asked how things were going. What else could I say? I said I didn't really know anything. 
But why didn't you tell me about Olive? The investigator's eyes flickered strangely. He lowered his head, and then said firmly that he had a lot of work to do and did not have to say the same thing twenty times. Slamming the door, he left the office. He did not like this investigator. To hell with him. The main thing was that Olive was really alive and now he had to find her, so she could explain to him personally what it was he knew and why she had run away. And then he stopped, another thought burned him. So Kayla knew Olive was alive, and she was hiding it. What the hell was that? It was urgent to talk to his ex-wife. But her phone wasn't answering. And when he arrived at the apartment he had bought for Kayla as a payoff, he didn't go any further than the locked door. He knocked on the door, rang the bell in vain. What are you doing here? An elderly woman looked out of the apartment across the street, I'll call the police. I just came from there, replied Josiah tiredly, do you know where the landlady is? And who are you? Ex-husband. Ex, that's how Kayla left. She's been on vacation somewhere in the Arab Emirates for a week now, the grandmother looked at Josiah with some disdain, she's found herself a nice man. He is her boss and he loves her a lot. So they left together. I'm glad for her. Josiah replied with a chuckle, and when is she coming? So I don't know. She doesn't report to me. Josiah went down the stairs, and the woman next door kept muttering something in his wake, here, he left such a nice woman, and now he's running around. Serves him right. And Kayla's a beauty. He plays in the TV series, the husband came to his senses. It's too late. All these men are the same. Josiah from Kayla's house stopped by a children's store and asked the saleswoman to pick out clothes for a boy about five years old. He's like this, Josiah explained on his fingers. The girl nodded understandingly, smiled, and soon two full bags of clothes were on the register. Maybe you need more toys, the girl suggested. I don't know what interests them at that age, Josiah wondered and his gaze stopped on a trinket. No, that's for babies, she followed his gaze and laughed, here, look, here are cars, robots, airplanes. We have a new model. Helicopters with remote control. I think your boy will be delighted. I bought mine, so he and my husband are almost climbing into the fray. Did your husband like it? Yeah, he's quite a boy. Only he's over 30 years old. I'm sure you'll like it too. Go ahead, Josiah bought both a helicopter, some cars, and a couple of obscure robots. Already leaving the store, laden with packages, he sadly thought, and if Declan mine? How much I had missed. Yes, rattles and pyramids, it's probably also so interesting. The final cord was a trip to the candy store, where Josiah bought a huge cake. When he returned home with all his purchases, skies made marveled. That's a lot of stuff. Chef Samantha was even a little offended. Couldn't she bake a cake like this herself? Dash, and anyway, it's not good for the boy to have sweets, she grumbled, I fed him chicken soup and cutlets. And I gave him juice, too. He ate it all, smiled Josiah. He pecked like a sparrow, sighed Samantha, he eats very little. And in general, he's a good boy. Josiah, will you make it clear to us, is this your boy? Samantha, I don't know yet myself, Josiah shook his head. The cook nodded her head understandingly. Though she honestly didn't understand anything, and neither did Skye, who preferred to mind her own business. But she honestly dealt with the boy. She even enjoyed interacting with him. Such a sweet, well-behaved child. And on the owner so similar. What was the story, everyone was interested. But it was none of their business. Declan, meanwhile, was watching cartoons in the living room, laughing while watching the adventures of the characters. He did not notice anyone around him. The kid seemed to have forgotten what he was going through or was just distracted. On seeing Josiah, the smile disappeared. Hello, he whispered shyly. Hello, Josiah smiled and lightly touched his head, stroking it. God, what silky hair and eyes. It's like he's looking at himself as a little boy. 
Josiah swallowed the sudden lump in his throat. There's no need for expertise here. He can see that the boy is his. Josiah sat down next to the child, are you watching cartoons? Yes, the child answered faintly. Declan, what are you doing, astonished Josiah, are you afraid of me or something? I don't know, the boy admitted. Don't be afraid, I won't hurt you, Josiah hugged the boy, listen, I need to talk to your mother. Do you know where to find her? I don't know. Where did you live? In Winfield. That's right. That was the name of the village on Olive's passport. And who did you live with? With my mother, my grandmother and Maya. Do you miss them? Josiah looked at the boy, well, don't worry. Things will get better. By the way, I bought so many things there. Shall we go and have a look? And more toys. As the girl at the toy store said, Declan liked the helicopter best of all. His eyes lit up, a smile appeared on his face. Josiah also liked to launch this plastic machine. In short, they had a lot of fun, almost broke an expensive vase in the living room. Even if it did crash, it's not much trouble, Josiah laughed, and with him Declan, who was now unafraid of this big stranger uncle whom Mama had told him to call Papa. The servants, on the other hand, were mildly shocked. Never had they seen Josiah fooling around like a boy. In the evening, while putting the boy to bed, Josiah read a story aloud for the first time in his life. With such pleasure he turned the pages, himself immersed in the adventure. Declan's eyes were slipping. Sleep, son, Josiah whispered and adjusted the blanket. Son. What a sweet word that turns out to be. And he slept the sweet sleep of a baby that night. And in the morning he woke up with the exact idea of what to do next, we must go to this Winfield and right now. Finishing his business at work, leaving Declan in Skye's care, he went in search of Olive. It was possible to get by train, but Josiah decided to go his own way. Halfway there, he would rest at a roadside inn and be on his way. Driving confidently, he could not forget Declan's eyes as he said, Goodbye. Are you leaving me, too? The boy asked, sobbing, Don't go. We played so well together. I'll be back, baby, Josiah hugged the boy and kissed him soundly on the cheek, just a few days and we'll be together again. Together. Yes. Now Josiah was sure that he would not part with the boy. It was his son. The DNA results weren't in yet. And what new things would he see there? Declan is his son. He can feel it. Grandma Madeline got up early that morning to make pancakes for her granddaughter. She loves them very much. And today Maya had a big event at school, her granddaughter is in a recitation contest. Such a good poem she learned a long one, something about friendship, about loyalty. Olive picked it up for her, and together they learned it, but her daughter had to leave and took Declan with her. The old woman sighed heavily and wiped away a tear. Why are they so unlucky? She and Olive, all her life she was alone, and her daughter had to. Olive, and it's hard to understand why she's being punished like this. She's so nice and sweet and hasn't hurt anybody in her life. But she had to face such problems. Will she never see her grandson again? Grandma Madeline burst into tears. Why did they have to go through such an ordeal? Oh Olive. I wish God would hear my mother's prayers and remove the trouble, the old woman sighed heavily, wiped away her tears. Sighing either from physical pain, that all joints twisted, or from mental pain, she took up pancakes. Soon she was a little distracted and was deftly flipping pancakes in a pan. Hi, Grandma, a blonde girl about 10 years old, came into the kitchen, it smells so good in here. There's a pile of pancakes waiting for you. Go on, wash your face and get into school, because it's almost time for school. I ironed your uniform and made bows for you yesterday. Shall we wear bows? Of course. The teacher said it's formal wear, the girl nodded. Soon Maya was happily eating pancakes. And Grandma Madeline, propping her cheek, admired her granddaughter. She's growing up beautiful, she looks like Olive. Grandma, will you come to see me, Maya asked, 
drinking the last pancake with aromatic herbal tea. Of course, I'll support you. Just don't worry there. Read the way you and your mom used to. Maya lowered her head, trying to hide the tears, Grandma, do you think mom will come back? Dash, she will, Grandma Madeline nodded vigorously, I ask Nicholas the miracle worker every day. And Declan? Maybe she shouldn't have taken him with her. Granddaughter, mom's right. It's better this way. We'll all get together again. Now it was Grandma Madeline's turn to wipe away her tears. But she quickly came to her senses, got up on a stool with difficulty, and went into her room. She had to get her granddaughter ready for school. And after crossing her granddaughter afterwards, the old lady knelt for a long time near a small icon. What did her heart pray for? What was her soul weeping for? And Nicholas the wonder worker, nonchalantly looking from the icon, listened and understood. Could he help? Only the Lord God could decide. After weeping and calming down, Grandma Madeline went to school. Maya was the best today. No wonder the girl got first place in her age group for reciting a poem. The grandmother and granddaughter and school returned proud. Maya carefully held the winner's diploma and joyfully looked at her grandmother Tanya. I wish I could call my mother now, make her happy, the girl said. I wish, sighed the old woman, but you can't reach her. There's no connection there. Yes, I know. They talked over and over, and when they reached the yard, they were both taken aback. A fancy car was parked at the gate. An unfamiliar tall, dark-haired man got out of it and headed toward them. Hello, he said, can you tell me, please, does Olive live here? And who are you? Grandma Madeline asked a little puzzled, eyeing the stranger and his machine warily. My name is Josiah. I am an acquaintance of Olive. I'd like to talk to her. Josiah, the old lady was surprised and grabbed her heart, you're the one. I don't know if you're the one or not, Josiah was confused by the older woman's reaction, do you know Olive? That's my daughter, the old woman admitted, my name is Madeline. What are you here for? She's gone to see you, and she took me to see you. That's why I'm here. I can't understand anything. Where is Olive, answered Josiah impatiently, I need her to explain it to me personally. I thought I had no child all these years, and now there's a son. Call Olive. She's not here, Madeline replied quietly, and you really don't know anything? What? I don't know, shouted Josiah almost pitifully. Then he added, explain it to me. Let's go inside, replied the old woman with a sigh, I need a break. Maya, run, open the door. The girl, looking curiously at the unfamiliar uncle, ran forward into the courtyard. The old woman and her guest followed her. Josiah looked around with interest. God, how miserable everything is here. The fence was crooked, a structure at the back of the yard. Probably a barn, the roof of which had sagged. And the house itself is old. It is visible, there is no a man's hand here, and there is not much money. Though it is clean, the grass is mown, flowers grow in beds in the yard. The house did not smell of prosperity either, everything was old, but neat. Madeline's neat grandmother showed her guest into the kitchen, sat him down at the table, and put the kettle on herself. She was silent. Josiah was silent, too. Both did not know how to start a conversation. Maya peeked in and immediately ran out. Is that Olive's daughter? I remember her saying, Josiah asked awkwardly. Yes. That's our Maya. Thanks to you she lives, said Madeline with a sigh, but at least you did a good deed. Why did you do this to my little girl? How, cried Josiah, everything was fair. You know about surrogacy. I know. I was against it at first, but Maya had to be saved. I agreed with my daughter. Who knew that you would cheat her like that? Declan is our joy, though. Everything was fair, she's carrying our child, and we're even. And what did she do? She ran away and faked her own death. Faked her death, the old lady sat down on her stool, pale with surprise, Olive certainly didn't do any such thing. 
I would have known. You're talking trash about her. But you and your wife took advantage of the silly girl. How did we take advantage? Olive understood that she was kind of, excuse me, an incubator for our baby. And she basically took him for herself. Is that how it works? And that's after we paid her. Don't you really know anything, the older woman said thoughtfully, you should ask your wife then. I can't. She and I are divorced. She went away. And then they brought me a child at work, a letter from Olive, which I didn't understand. You can't imagine the shock I got. I thought Olive and the baby had died in that car. I don't know anything about the car. But listen about Olive and the baby, if you don't know. My daughter told me everything when she came back to the village with her stomach. She cried on my shoulder, and I listened and cried too. Such rich people. Why do they think they're allowed everything? Speak up already, pleaded Josiah, and Grandma Madeline began her story. Olive went into surrogacy out of desperation. She had to save her daughter. And to be honest, she didn't realize the seriousness of what she was doing. She made it clear to herself that the child she was going to carry was a stranger. Yes, an incubator, but she would do anything to save Maya. When Josiah paid for the surgery while she was still early in her pregnancy, Olive worshipped him, too. It was a miracle. The young woman vowed to herself that she would never do anything bad to him, that she would have the baby and give it to him. As time went on. The baby was developing. All was well. Josiah turned out to be a wonderful man. He took an interest in Olive's affairs. They often talked in the evenings. Olive noticed that Josiah's wife, Kayla, was tense, but she was cool about it. There was nothing between her and Josiah. Kayla wasn't interested in the baby because she was carrying it, when Olive would give birth and her maternal instincts would kick in. But Olive got her maternal instincts up first. The longer the term grew, the more she realized how hard it would be for her to give up her baby, the one who was now under her heart, kicking under her ribs, turning over in her belly. She remembered the main thing, the baby was not hers, and she had already received payment for it. Her baby girl was alive and well. That morning Josiah was away on business in another city. Olive was going to the clinic for another checkup. Kayla was going to take her. When Olive was ready, the landlady peeked into the room. Are you ready? She asked Kayla dismissively. Yes, I'm ready. Kayla grinned something and walked into the room, closing the door behind her, standing across from Olive and staring at her mockingly with her arms crossed over her chest. So you're ready to give us your baby? Your baby, Olive was confused, it's your baby. Stupid. It's your baby, Kayla grinned, they fertilized your egg, not mine. How's that? There's a pact, Olive's heart raced. That's right, the contract, and it's what you're going to give us the baby anyway. Is that what you want? I don't believe you, I don't understand, Olive babbled, feeling that she was about to choke with excitement. Calm down, you'll give birth before your time. Anyway, it was like this. And Kayla said that during the examination it turned out that her eggs are not viable. It cost her a lot of effort to convince the doctor not to tell Josiah. She paid a considerable amount of money to have the doctor perform all the manipulations on Olive's eggs. At the time, Kayla thought it was the right thing to do. Josiah was nervous. He wanted children. If this eco went badly, he would just leave Kayla. And when your belly started growing, I realized I couldn't lie to the man I loved for the rest of my life, Kayla said. I told him everything. And what, Olive looked at the woman with eyes full of horror. And he laughed. Called me stupid. He said it didn't matter whose egg it was. What matters is that it will be our baby and even if you ever find out the truth, he'll hire the best lawyers and they won't let you near the baby anyway, Kayla chuckled theatrically, yes, I have him like that. Why are you telling me this now, whispered Olive, I might not have known. But now you do. And it's up to you, Kayla shrugged, you see, I realized that I could never love this child. This whole thing with Eco, my husband's initiative. We lived so much together. 
And we will continue to live that way. What do I need diapers, diapers? I'm made for love and the stage. It's all so drab. So I've decided to give you a chance to disappear quietly. Do you want this baby? Of course I do, I'm carrying him under my heart. Not knowing he was mine, I loved him more than life. And now I can't give him up, Olive said just as quietly, are you telling the truth? Oh, my god. Of course I am. Did Josiah know it's my baby? Of course I confessed. I'm telling you, it doesn't matter to him who the mother is. All that matters is that we're going to be together. Don't you hear me? I don't want a baby. Go to your village, live there, raise him. You got the money. And the baby is a bonus for you. And Josiah? He'll look for it and find it. Don't worry about that. I've thought of everything. But it's none of your business. And Olive agreed. With Kayla on the way to the train station, just in case, they stopped by the clinic, and the same doctor confirmed Kayla's words. Yes, Olive was carrying her baby. Yes, she could have raised a scandal. But what would she have accomplished? The baby would have been taken from her anyway. And now, knowing the truth, she couldn't give it up that easily. So she decided to go back to her mother in the village. She was very hurt that Josiah had done that to her, because if he knew the truth, he could talk to her. Olive seemed to have a relationship of trust between them. But no. What did she expect, though? He loves his wife. Yes, Olive was afraid to admit to herself that she had fallen in love with Josiah. And now a cruel disappointment awaited her. She would hide, disappear, dissolve. Kayla bought her own ticket, put her on the train, and Olive went home with the baby under her heart, her own baby. In the village, when they saw Olive pregnant, people were talking about who had given birth to Olive. What's the big deal, though? It was a mundane thing. She had one child before, and now she's going to have two. But Madeline was more or less healthy at the time. All the village gossips shut up. Olive gave birth on time to a healthy boy. Named him Declan. And all these years she raised her children, put her heart and soul into them. Maya loved her little brother, too. She was such a wonderful nurse. And Madeline was relieved. It seems that the city girl kept her word, they are not looking for Olive. The only thing is that when she was pregnant, she went to the district center to renew the passport. For some reason it took a long time, but then they gave her a new document. And where Olive lost her passport, she could not remember. She must have dropped it on the train on her way home. She had no time for the passport. Time passed Olive took an accounting course at the district employment center, got a job at an office. At the same time she took a correspondence course at a university. Home, children, work, studies, she got terribly tired. But she coped with it. And Madeline helped out around the house. Although her legs began to hurt terribly with age. Doctors diagnosed her with arthrosis and it is difficult to cure it. And it takes a lot of money. Besides, an elderly woman was diagnosed with diabetes. In a word, the illnesses were clinging to her like a clove. Olive more and more had to do her own work at home and in the garden. It was good that at least her mother would cook. And then weakness began to set in that she could hardly get out of bed in the morning. Olive thought that it was from overexertion, from fatigue. She bought some vitamins, but they did not help. She went to the regional hospital. There she started to talk about vitamins, daily regime, and then the tests came. And the doctors suspected something more serious. They sent her to the city. It turned out that Olive had a tumor in her head. It was impossible to tell what kind of a tumor until after the surgery. Though, doctors averred their eyes, saying, according to all indications, the tumor is malignant. And even if he had an operation there was not much chance to survive. And we need a lot of money for treatment. Where can I get it? A single mother with two children, with a sick mother to boot, doesn't have any. Olive soon realized herself that she was not doing very well. What to do? 
The young woman imagined her children being orphaned and then what? Then they would be taken away from the orphanage. Surely they would. Her mother was ill, and they would not allow her custody. I feel sorry for Maya, and for Declan, and a little for myself. One day she accidentally came across an article on the internet about an old man who lives somewhere in the steppe. He heals people, he is not a quack, that is for sure, he does not take care of everyone. But if he says yes, then the man must completely trust him, break off ties with the world. A year or two passes and the person comes back completely healthy. Olive told her mother about this article. It's a fairy tale, Madeline shook her head, he'll take the money and that's it. Where do I get the money from? He doesn't charge anything for his treatment, Olive protested, and they say a lot of good things about him on the internet. They do, but how is it really? I won't know what it's like until I try it myself, Olive replied firmly, Mother, I've made up my mind. I'm going to look for this old man. Daughter, you're so weak. But while you still have strength, you have to try. But maybe you will agree to the operation? The doctors are not fools either. They're not stupid, but they've already written me off. Do you understand? Yesterday in the clinic I was sitting for pills, and the nurse and doctor were talking about me. The nurse says I need more painkillers, and the doctor says it's only for a couple of months. Then it won't be necessary. Mom, do you understand? They knew I was sitting here, waiting for a prescription. That's what they said. And in the city? They seem to agree to do my surgery. And then they add that all the responsibility lies with me. For the result of this operation, no one is responsible. This is real grief, my daughter. Is this how you got into it? cried Madeline. It's all right, mommy. Let's hope for the best. Just have to do something with Declan. Mom, you have to consider both options. What if I don't come back? Custody will come to you and I don't think they'll let you keep two kids. Okay, Maya's bigger now. Maybe they will. And they'll take Declan to an orphanage for sure. What are we gonna do? He can't be an orphan with a living father. I'll take him to town with Josiah. He is his son. He won't do him any harm. Oh, how Madeline was against it then. How could she give her grandson to some uncle? It was not to be. But Olive convinced her. She had already found out on the internet that Josiah is just as successful in business. He is rich. In fact, finding out he has a son should make him happy. After all, he wanted one five years ago. And Kayla? Well, make a deal with her, I guess. Olive did not know that Josiah and Kayla were divorced. She wrote a letter to Josiah, in which she confusedly explained what she had done, and then she talked to Declan. She told him that he had a daddy and would have to live with him. And you, the boy cried, and Maya? And Grandma? They'll come to you later, Olive lied. She thought she was doing the right thing, I'll be back. I just need to heal up a little bit. In the hospital, Declan clarified, wiping away her tears. At the hospital, Olive hugged him, don't worry. They'll love you there. I don't want to. I need to be with you. Son, you can't be with me. I promise you I'll always be there for you in my mind. Do you believe me? Declan didn't answer anything, just nodded and snuggled into his mother's fragrant hair. Yes, he will do as his mother asks. The main thing is for her to get well. And he is a grown-up, he understands everything, he will bear it. Olive and Declan went into town. There she easily found the office of Josiah's firm and left her son, and then, hiding behind a tree not far from the office, watched closely. She saw Josiah arrive, then come out with Declan, get into the car. That he would not hurt the child was something she felt with her motherly heart, and then Olive cried as she sat in the square. She had given up her son with her own hands. That's exactly what they wanted her to do five years ago. She couldn't then, ran away, hid, but God must have punished her. Olive called her mother and told her that Declan was with Josiah and they were doing well. Daughter, can't you go to the hospital now, she didn't ask, 
but begged her Madeline. No, mother, I will do as I have decided. You kiss Maya for me and tell her I love her very, very much. I promise I'll do everything I can to get back to you, Olive replied, barely holding back her tears, you just don't call me. It would make me feel better. God bless you, my darling, my only daughter, Madeline sobbed, may everything work out for you. I will pray for you, my darling. Thank you, mommy, they said, goodbye, and Olive never answered the phone again. It was out of range. Apparently she had turned it off, so as not to end up hurting her wounded heart. Madeline told Maya that her mother was out of touch at the hospital, but that she would call as soon as she felt better. And Maya began to wait. She really missed her mom, her little brother, but the girl believed her mom would be back soon. And so would Declan. In the meantime, she was her grandmother's main helper, she would study well and please her with her successes. Josiah listened to what the old woman was telling him and could not believe that it was all true. How could it be that he, an experienced businessman, an intelligent man, had been so tricked? And by whom? It turns out Kayla. She got rid of Olive. But why? And then Josiah remembered his interactions with Olive, their conversations, their innocent jokes, their smiles. He liked this girl for her simplicity, naivety, and purity. He was even flattered that his child was carried by such a real mother. I remember he even asked Olive's permission several times to touch her belly, to listen to how the baby was turning there, moving a leg or a hand. Those were beautiful moments. One day Kayla saw such a scene and then started a scandal with Josiah saying that he and the surrogate mother decided to have an affair. What kind of affair was it? Kayla did not understand his feelings about his father-to-be. He was just waiting for a miracle, but the miracle did not happen. Now Josiah understood why Kayla was terribly jealous of Olive, but did not show it. And when she realized that the situation could go further, she decided to act. Had she persuaded the doctors at the hospital to commit a crime? Is Declan really my son and Olive's son, he said confusedly as he listened to Madeline's story. You mean you didn't know anything, Madeline wondered, too, so your wife tricked Olive into saying you knew everything? I didn't know anything. And if I had known, if I had known, I would never have taken the child away from the mother, and I would always have helped, answered Josiah firmly, it was a mistake Olive didn't talk to me then. Although I understand that she would not have been given. My wife made up a very clever combination, Josiah began to guess, that the story with the burned-out car did not occur by chance. He had yet to find out everything. But that's for later. Tell me, how is Declan, Madeline asked pitifully, my heart bleeds for my grandson. Who did you leave him with? He's my housekeeper Kyra now. You don't have to worry. She's a very good person. She has children of her own, she knows how to communicate. Anyway, she'll be fine. I bought him some toys and clothes. Samantha, my cook, she promised to make all sorts of goodies. He likes dumplings, came Maya's voice. The girl was standing at the door and appeared to be eavesdropping. Maya, Grandma Madeline wondered, why are you eavesdropping? But Declan is my brother. I should know, Maya looked up, I'm worried, too. Josiah turned to the girl and smiled confusedly. So this is the little one he helped five years ago. What a sweet little girl. How nice that everything worked out for her then. Don't worry, Josiah waved at her, come and join us. It's not as if we're strangers now. We should work it out together. What is to be decided, the girl asked cautiously. How to help our mother. You see, she's used to solve everything herself, that's the way her life has turned out. She shouldn't have trusted me, but that's all right, we'll find her and help her. Maya nodded confidently. The girl guessed for the last few days that her mother had not gone to the hospital, something else had happened. And then she found her correspondence on the internet with some people who wrote to her about the elder, explaining how to find him. Maya told Josiah about it. She trusted him because she saw that he was a good man. And Declan looked so much like him. Will you show me that correspondence? asked Josiah. 
All right, the girl nodded, it all says mama must be helped. We'll figure it out, Josiah promised, and a couple of hours later he drove back to town. He said he would bring Declan back soon, or don't you have to, he suddenly came to his senses, it's hard enough for you. What are you, Madeline exclaimed as she walked him to the exit, I only now realized what a fool I was when I agreed with Olive. We'll manage it together somehow. And don't worry about custody. The assessment will be ready soon. No one will take anyone to the orphanage, Josiah promised, except that you also understand me correctly. I want to know for sure if Declan is Olive's child. How can I prove it to you now without her? Madeline fluttered her arms. Can you give me Maya's toothbrush? If he and Declan are related by blood, no more questions, answered Josiah. Yet there were still doubts in his heart. Had he been so cleverly deceived at the clinic? Madeline's grandmother immediately rushed into the house and soon brought out the girl's toothbrush, just as Josiah had asked. Here's more, Josiah took out his wallet and pulled out some large bills, here you go. This is for you for the first time. And I also want to send a construction crew to you. I see that you have no foundation, the walls need to be insulated. Winter's coming. Oh, why, embarrassed grandmother Madeline, we can do it ourselves. You helped us so much with Maya. That was a long time ago, Josiah smiled, and life goes on. And don't refuse to help. You don't know who owes who anymore, and he left. And Grandma Madeline stood looking after the car. What a good man this Josiah is. He is a worthy father to Declan. I wish Olive would recover her. Thoughts of her daughter made the old woman sad again. She wept. But why was her beauty so unlucky? And now this sickness. And where to look for her? The first thing Josiah did in town was to stop by the clinic where he did the DNA test and explain what he wanted. I see, nodded the female lab technician, we'll get it done. It'll just take a little more time to do it. Do it right, Josiah agreed. Now he wasn't rushing things. He just wanted to document everything. And his heart was already sure, Declan was Olive's own son and his. He arrived home while Declan was still asleep. Josiah was surprised, it was already about 1 p.m. And the baby was asleep. Skye was embarrassed, and then confessed, yesterday she let the boy watch cartoons late, and then fell asleep herself. Anyway, when exactly Declan fell asleep, she doesn't know. Josiah, you'll forgive me, but I have all the chores and the baby. And yesterday I wanted to go to my family, did not work, and because I also have children growing up. I can't work like this. Yes, Sky, I'm sorry. You're right. I've put too much on you, Josiah agreed, I'll get a nanny today. It won't be long though. I'll take Declan back to Grandma's soon. To Granny's? Yeah, that's how it is. Turns out I have a son. And he has a grandmother, a sister, and a mother. Only the mother has yet to be found, Josiah said this, and went to his room to change his clothes. We had to go to the office. There was no time to rest. Sky remained standing there with her mouth open. Who was she, Declan's mother? But why guess? She'll find out in time. The first thing he did at work was summon Katya to his office. After asking her about her business, he moved on to the important question. Ariel, you have a child, don't you? Yes, a daughter, Ariel tensed a little. Did someone tell the boss that they had to take Tilly with them to the office yesterday? Another pipe burst in the nursery, Josiah, don't you swear. She wasn't bothering anyone here yesterday, she told herself. She told her, worriedly, about the pipe, about the tutor, about the fact that her husband was on a business trip, and that the nanny had another order. The supervisor only raised his eyebrows, and then smiled. Ariel. Do not worry so much. I'm not asking because you brought your daughter here. Of course, it's against the rules, but we all have force majeure circumstances. Everything is normal. Is the daycare working today? Yes, Ariel's jaw even dropped at this answer from the chief, which was infectious. 
Ariel, you said something about a nanny. Can you tell me where to find a good one? I need a few days. The agency does not want to go. I need someone I can trust, someone who really loves kids. I can recommend Lexi. I leave Tilly with her. She's nice. I just need to know if she'll be able to do it. Find out, please, I need it today. It's just for a couple of days. And preferably with accommodation. And yes, if your girl will have no one to leave at this time, then you can take her to my house. The babysitter can take care of too, right? That's for sure. Yes, she can. I'll call her now, and then, if necessary, I'll give you her coordinates, Ariel nodded. And then in the waiting room she kept marveling at how the boss had changed in literally 24 hours. He was again, as before, open, smiling, human, as if that baby had had such an effect on him. And he was the one looking for a nanny for him. Lexi was free and agreed. Josiah liked the babysitter, a former teacher on well-deserved leave, but also very lively, active, modern. They met within an hour of Ariel's call and talked it over. Declan must like her. Afterwards, he started looking for Olive. First he called all the hospitals. Maybe she changed her mind and went to the doctors after all, or maybe she got sick in the street. But she was nowhere to be found. So she had gone to that old man. Josiah did not believe in these tales of miraculous cures and decided to go look for Olive. He could not explain himself for what purpose. After all, who was she to him? No one. Although no, she is the mother of his child, and he must have felt for this unfortunate young woman. She needs urgent medical attention. He would pay for her treatment as much as he needed to. And he also wanted to tell her, looking her in the eye, that he was not guilty of anything to her. Josiah looked at the picture he'd taken from his laptop at Madeline's house, Olive's correspondence with other people on the internet about this elder. He estimated the route on the plane, and then he'd figure out where to look. Just need to sort out everything at the firm, so that during his absence, everything works without error. That would take two days. And then Declan must be taken to his grandmother, because Josiah knew that it is difficult for a boy in an unfamiliar environment, even if he would have the best nurse in the world. There is no one better than grandma and sis. Olive, why did you take the child out of the familiar environment? It makes sense, though. She did not believe in her cure, so she rescued her son from the orphanage. And she was right to do so. Otherwise, Josiah would have never known the whole truth and lived a lie. Toward evening Josiah stopped by the clinic to see a famous oncologist. He had made an appointment with him back in the morning. Josiah really wanted to understand what was really wrong with Olive. He had taken the medical documents from Madeline, too. Olive had not taken them with her, this confirmed once more Josiah's speculation that she had gone to the elder, not hoping to return. She had simply left, so that no one would see her torment. And the elder was like a placebo. Might it help? Kaysen's doctor took a long look at Olive's scans, reading her medical notes. I understand why the woman was reluctant to operate, he said. After a short silence, the tumor is in a hard-to-reach place, and there is a high risk of affecting the optic nerve. It's not clear what kind of tumor it is. The girl's mother said that the doctors were leaning toward the possibility that it was a malignant tumor. At the same time, the tests are bad, headaches, weakness are all circumstantial signs. I need an operation. Can you do it? I can, but I have a waiting list a year in advance. Doctor, please. Kaysen thought about turning Josiah down. He couldn't, for it was his interlocutor's work that had built the new hospital building. I'm sorry, but this is quite an expensive operation. No, I won't take a penny, but the equipment, the materials, he finally said. I understand, Josiah interrupted him, I'll pay for everything. How much? The amount, of course, was decent but Josiah was not embarrassed. Kaysen was embarrassed when he heard that the patient still had to be found. Gone, the doctor shook his head, what kind of people are we? Why do they believe all kinds of nonsense? It must be out of desperation. 
Your colleagues told her almost to her face that she didn't have long to live, pronounced Josiah, thank you for saying otherwise. You're welcome, for now. You will certainly look for her. Time is not working in our favor. Josiah walked out of the clinic both encouraged and alarmed. Yes, Olive could still be helped, but how to find her? And then he decided to change all his plans, he would take the first flight out. Declan will have to live at his house without his grandmother and Maya. Lexi will look after him. As much as she says Josiah will pay. And the business? He's doing well enough as it is. In the evening, while putting Declan to bed, Josiah gently kissed the top of his head. God. How wonderful it is to have a son. And in the morning he flew away, having made all the necessary arrangements at work. Besides that, Josiah remembered to tell and pay the construction crew to repair Madeline's house. He had promised. And in the meantime Kayla was returning from her vacation. The woman was a little disappointed with the trip. She had expected more from her new lover. He promised a luxurious apartment, romantic boat rides. Kayla dreamed of vacationing by the sea. After all, her next lover introduced himself to her as an Arabian sheik. He came up to her after the performance, gave her a mind-boggling bouquet, looked at her so lovingly that Kayla just drowned in the black pool of his eyes, but she also counted how much his wristwatch cost. When they lived in the capital, everything was super, the restaurants and the bed. Then Ahmed left, but he promised to send her a ticket to the Arab Emirates soon. He wanted to introduce Kayla to his country, to his family. And he made quite transparent hints about the marriage proposal. When the email with the plane ticket came, Kayla was rejoicing. Destiny had once again turned to her radiant face. And then lately everything became kind of depressing, there were fewer and fewer roles, the money that left her Josiah, almost no more. Where did she spend it? Yes, on a young gigolo, who left her not long ago. And here Ahmed. She's got it all ahead of her. What's all these soap operas and hackneyed performances? She'll be conquering Hollywood soon. Ahmed will help her. Things were not so rosy when she arrived in the United Arab Emirates. Ahmed at the airport did not meet her, sent a cab, and in a wreck she reached the hotel, a room which, it turns out, Ahmed rented for her. And it was far from a five-star. Kayla was in mild shock. She waited for an explanation. How could she be treated like that? She is a star, a goddess, and he puts her in some ruin. Ahmed arrived in the evening and without further formality said that Kayla would be his third wife. Now they are going to go and meet his family. Kayla raised a scandal, but a blow to the solar plexus clearly tempered her ardor. Ahmed grabbed her like a sack of potatoes and dragged her out of the hotel. No one stopped him, though Kayla tried to shout for help. Everyone around her pretended not to notice anything. Ahmed brought her to an ordinary three-room apartment, where one room was occupied by his two wives, another one by his four children, and the third was his bedroom. That's when Kayla realized that Ahmed is no sheik. He's just an ordinary office worker. He needed a third wife because his other two couldn't manage the household. He had four children, and one wife was pregnant again. Ahmed explained to Kayla that her duties would include washing dishes, doing laundry, and cleaning. And sometimes sleep with him. Dash, even though you're old, he said with a chuckle, but once a month I'll let you be with me too. Kayla was outraged. How is that possible? She's an actress, a star. And she was turned into a waiting room attendant by a strange Arab. Kayla tried to make a scene, she even took a swing and slapped Ahmed in the face, but he was more agile. Moments later, the aftermath of his blow was red on Kayla's cheek. She cried through the night on the mattress that one of Ahmed's wives had thrown on the floor. And in the morning, the real horror came. Ahmed left for work with the door locked behind him. The four children, ages 10 to 2, were yelling, jumping, laughing, sometimes crying the whole time. Ahmed's wives were minding their own business, not thinking about parenting. But soon the pregnant one, apparently deciding to be a bit of an educator or some great educator, sat the kids down and started drawing with them. 
And before that, she brought and put a basin full of dirty clothes in front of Kayla, explaining with gestures for her to go to the bathroom and wash. Yesterday's actress, who became the third wife in an instant, was shocked, wanted to send this nasty woman, but realized that not only Ahmed knows how to unload her hands. She went to the bathroom in search of a washing machine, and there she was disappointed. There was no machine. The laundry had to be done by hand. Kayla could not take it anymore. How she shouted angrily, grabbing the mop. Everyone must have heard her. The wives must have had enough of her shouting, and then one of them took a key out of her pocket and opened the doors. Kayla realized she was being chased away. And that was salvation. But how do you find an embassy in a country when you're there for the first time? And also with no money, no documents, and no phone. For a few days Kayla tried to earn some money for food, helped to wash dishes in some diner, and slept there. Then she went out to the beach. There she met a beverage man. He was a nice guy. He helped her walk to the embassy. And now Kayla was finally home. Yes, she has been to the Emirates. She won't tell anyone what really happened. If anyone asks, she'll say she just didn't like Ahmed. Already at home Kayla wondered how to live her life, the money ran out, there were no offers to play. Work in the theater brought a small income. And how could she so thoughtlessly spend all the money Josiah? She had to look for a new lover. But the thought of Ahmed sobered her. What if the new one is a forgotten old one? Yes, Josiah. Their divorce means nothing. I mean, he'd always loved her, divorced out of jealousy, but maybe he's calmed down now. Especially since Kayla knew for a fact that Josiah was still single. Probably because he loves her. The conversation with her neighbor only convinced her that her thoughts were correct. She was just taking out the trash when the ubiquitous old lady from next door looked out. Oh, Kayla. You're back. You're tanned, you're beautiful. It did you good to rest. Kayla only nodded in response. If the old woman knew what kind of rest it was. And you alone? Where's that hot brunette who used to bring you roses in bunches, the neighbor winked. He wasn't my type, Kayla replied with dignity and headed down the stairs. Indeed. Why do you want him, she said, why don't you get back together with your husband? What husband, Kayla wondered, and turned to her neighbor. She had never exactly reported her marital status. Yes, he came to you, looking for you. He was a tall, stocky brunette, but not as black as the one with the roses. Josiah was here? Kayla smiled happily, unable to hide her joy. Yes, he was, the neighbor nodded her head, he was very upset when he found out you'd left. What did you tell him, old fool? Kayla suddenly stepped up the stairs. Why are you cursing? Kayla, I didn't tell him anything about that Arab. I told him you went on vacation, that's all. Are you sure? Yeah, right, the neighbor even crossed herself and slammed the door. Kayla exhaled. It was a good thing Josiah didn't know anything about Ahmed. It would be easier to establish a relationship with him. All evening Kayla thought over her speech in front of Josiah, even practiced in front of the mirror. Yes, she was able to portray remorse very convincingly. Yes, she cheated on him, but she realized everything. If Josiah let her be given a second chance, they would have a real fairy tale in their lives. What Kayla meant to say is that she wants a baby. No one cancels the echo. Of course, the baby was the last thing on Kayla's mind. It was just in case. And then she'll figure it out under the circumstances. In the morning, with ashes on her head, she dialed Josiah. Here she was disappointed. Josiah was unavailable. By lunchtime he seemed to be online, but as soon as Kayla dialed he was out of range again. Where the hell had he been? Kayla decided to go to his house. At the same time and see how it is without her at the mansion. The guard, when he saw her at the entrance, was speechless. Kayla? Are you, he muttered in surprise. I am, Kayla smiled coquettishly, is Josiah at home? No. He's away. 
So, then I'll wait for him, she replied and walked past the guard, squeezing him with her shoulder. The huge man did not take any action. And who knew him? Maybe they had already made up. There was no instruction to keep Kayla out. Kayla walked down the path to the house, noting that nothing much has changed here, the same beautiful, well-built rich. And so she wanted to live here again. No one answered the doorbell for a long time. Finally, the door opened. Kayla saw an old woman with a boy about five years old. Who are you, Kayla wondered. Lexi, replied the woman, and who are you? I'm Josiah's wife, Kayla answered, her head cocked, and as she pushed the nanny aside with her shoulder, she went inside. I don't understand, who's the boy? Whose is he? It's Josiah's son, replied Lexi calmly, and if you're the wife. Why don't you know? What do you care, replied Kayla confusedly and stared at the child, son. How? I don't know. I'm sorry. Let me see some I got D. Why would that be, exclaimed Kayla, who are you? Sky looked out at the noise, followed by Samantha. Oh my god. Kayla, the cook wondered, what are you doing here? Josiah invited me, Kayla lied, and a few days ago. I only now could come. Where is he, anyway? He's gone away. Oh, dear. He said something. Well, I'll just stay here for now. My room is free, I hope. And under the silent consent of the servants she went to their former bedroom with Josiah. Kayla decided to act brazenly, she would fall at Josiah's feet, but beg his forgiveness. Only the boy, who's the kid? Where had he come from? A frightening conjecture pierced Kayla, but she decided not to act yet, to find out everything carefully. It seems that the boy is here alone. His mother is definitely not in the house. At the first opportunity Kayla literally dragged the house helper into the room. So tell me about the baby, she asked the maid. I don't know, Skye shrugged, his name is Declan. He's five years old. What's his mother's name? Olive, I think. Hearing this, Kayla's heart ached. It was Olive again. How could she be here? It had all worked out so well the other day. Where's Olive? At the hospital, I think. Which one? I don't know anything. You'd better ask Josiah. I'll be sure to ask, Kayla grumbled. And afterwards, lying in bed, she reasoned. Even if this Olive would have some claim, Kayla certainly wasn't a competitor. So Josiah found out about her son. So what's the big deal? You still have to beg his forgiveness. He loved Kayla so much. No Olive is no competition to her. On the other hand, it's a good thing she doesn't have to bring up the subject of children. There's already a son. That's not what's important. How to explain who was found in the car and whose body it was. She had nothing to do with it. The police got it wrong. And you can also blame Olive, as if it was her plan not to give up the child. Kayla's plan seemed pretty good. She'll improvise the details as she goes along. The main thing is to charm Josiah. And we also need to make contact with the boy, so that Josiah sees how Kayla trembles for him. Anyway, Kayla was starting her main epic and not on screen, but in life. She had to play it well. Her continued bland existence was in jeopardy. Except which clinic Olive, no one knew. Would she die? But that would only benefit Kayla. Olive stood in the vestibule. Now comes her stop, a small station. The train stands for one minute. The conductor looked anxiously at the pale as death passenger. Are you ill? Should we call an ambulance to the station, she asked Olive. No, I'm fine, the girl replied, losing her temples, I'm feeling better in the fresh air. It happens to me. Are you sick or something, sympathetically sighed the conductor, that's the trouble. I had a son like that when he was younger, both on the bus and on the train, but he got better with age. And you cannot pass, right, and she nodded Olive. Let the conductor better think it was seasickness. 
Olive didn't want the sympathetic look to become pity. That's pity Olive certainly didn't want. The train stopped, and Olive struggled to get down. The conductor held her up. Shouldn't we get an ambulance, she asked again. I'm supposed to be met, Olive even tried to smile, don't worry about it. It's all right. I am. Don't be sick, the conductor replied from the carriage and waved her hand at Olive. Thank you. And all the best to you, quietly replied the girl and smiled weakly in response. The train moved slowly away, and Olive, taking in more air, turned around. An older man with a gray beard, wearing a light-colored shirt and the same light-colored pants, was walking toward her. Are you Olive? he asked softly. Yes, Olive replied quietly. The fresh air did make her feel better, and she was able to get a better look at the stranger. Could it be the same old man? He had answered her when she had looked for him, had promised to meet him. Yes, it was him. Are you Caleb? she asked timidly. Yes, the old man confirmed, let's go. We still have a long way to go. He picked up Olive's light duffel bag and strode forward, while the girl hurried after him. She couldn't walk fast enough. Her legs felt as if they were cotton. The old man soon noticed this and slowed his pace. I see you are quite weak, he shook his head, and how long have you been like this? Yes, it's been a while since I've been on the road. Well, I'll make you feel better, promised Caleb. He sounded like a good promise, but his intonation gave Olive the creeps. She stopped for a second. Where had she gone, anyway? Why had she rushed for life-saving straws? Or maybe she should have gone to the hospital after all? Caleb noticed the girl's confusion. What's the matter with you, he wondered, are you afraid of me? Slightly, Olive admitted. You don't have to be afraid of me, the old man laughed. You'll like it here. If I'm going to help you, I'm going to help you. Tell me, how many people leave you, Olive hesitated a little, how many people leave you back? Everyone leaves. I can sense who my power might help. And if anything, I send them back right away. But I will help you. Thank you, Olive whispered gratefully. They reached the old car. The old man opened the door and nodded for Olive to sit down. Olive shrank inwardly, knowing that another attack of nausea would not be long in coming. Don't worry, it won't make her sick, Caleb nodded understandingly, here, drink my potion, and he held out a small plastic bottle of brown liquid to Olive. Olive unscrewed the cap. The liquid smelled of honey and some kind of herb. Cautiously she tasted it. It's good, she smiled. Drink it, the old man laughed, it's mother nature's medicine. And Olive bravely took another sip. Everything was blurred before her eyes. She remembered nothing else. She woke up in some barn on a pile of straw. The moon was shining through the leaky roof. Behind the wall some nightbird was screaming. Olive sat up abruptly. She felt dizzy, and already she felt habitually nauseous. Where is she? What had happened? Olive remembered the old man at the station, the car, the decoction bottle. Exactly. Something the old man had spiked. Oh, my God. Where the hell did she go? And more importantly, to whom? Someone on the opposite wall stirred. Dash, hey, you awake, came a hoarse female voice. Who's there, she whispered in fright. I'm Leslie. What's your name? Olive. Did you come to Caleb for treatment, too? The voice grinned. Yes. The woman stood up and walked over to Olive and sat down next to her. The girl could see her in the moonlight. She was about 40 years old. Long blonde hair, big eyes, painfully thin. Leslie was dressed in a white shapeless hoodie. Olive lowered her eyes and realized that she was wearing the exact same garment. I don't understand what's going on, she whispered, I'm in the wrong place. I was told Caleb was healing. And that's how he heals, Leslie grinned again, with fear and occupational therapy. How's that? And in the morning, you know. 
don't get scared before you know it. When I got here, I thought I was gonna die of fright, too. But that's okay. I've been holding on for almost a month now. I found Caleb on the internet, too. It said so well. Kind grandpa's a selfless helper and all that. But in reality he's a real slave driver, and Leslie told her story. She was diagnosed with some suspicious mole two years ago, underwent surgery, then a course of chemotherapy and seemed fine. The disease receded, but a few months ago, it returned in a more aggressive form. The doctors offered her chemo again, but they honestly said it wouldn't help for long. And then Leslie found beautiful fairy tales about Caleb on the internet, she believed them, had doubts for a long time, and then decided this was her chance. Leslie had no family. No one dissuaded her. So she went to the old man. He met her at the station, gave her something to drink, and then she ended up in the barn. And then she found out how Caleb treated her. He lived with his wife in a remote place, a river, mountains, and taiga all around. His house was strong, the homestead was fenced with a high fence, protection from curious, casual travelers. And behind this high fence, Caleb used the labor of unhappy people, who sought his final salvation. He set up a veritable mini-factory in his yard to produce various souvenirs and things, all the things tourists love. Caleb especially emphasized knitted things made of camel's hair. He bought untreated wool in Mongolia and had his slaves tidy it up and then spin it. His wife taught him how to knit, sometimes she herself could sit with a needle, but more unfortunate women did all the work. Those who could not knit, they quickly learned, as the lash was in use. No one tried to escape. Caleb had a clever idea, he took the already exhausted women to work. They couldn't sit, much less do anything with their hands. And they couldn't run away. When they were in pain or having an attack, he'd give them some kind of tincture that would make their heads swim. Are there many of them here, asked Olive fearfully, after listening to Leslie. It's just you and me now. And there were two others there gone. What do you mean, gone? Where did they go? Dead, I guess, Leslie answered with a sigh, Caleb sees when a man is very weak, takes him to another barn to die, I guess, and then gets rid of the body. How, I don't know, and I don't want to know. There is a mountain river nearby, though. Do you know how fast it is? It takes him away, wraps him up and scatters his bones on the rocks so that no one will find them. Or he buries the bodies in the taiga. My god. How many people have died here, Olive wondered. I don't know. I'll tell you one thing. He's been living here for five years. Willow, his wife, said something about it. Caleb, Willow, what important names they came up with. Olive cried. She was so frightened. What should she do now? What had she done? Yes, she understood that her trip would most likely be a one-way trip, but she certainly hadn't expected this. Olive remembered Maya, Declan, her mother, and she was so bitter. And she cried even harder. Don't cry, Leslie patted her shoulder, after all, we came here ourselves. They don't make fun of us, they just slap our hands with a whip sometimes when you don't work hard enough. These words made the hair on Olive's head stand on end. And now she has come to the good old man for treatment. I can't understand it. Why has no one found out what this Caleb is doing, said Olive, wiping away her tears. And who can prove they were here, sighed Leslie, there are no witnesses, you know. Well, the man went somewhere far away. A sick man is going to die soon enough. Maybe he didn't get there at all. That's why he's missing. Leslie, you talk so calmly about it. Aren't you scared already? No. And you'll calm down soon enough, Leslie hugged Olive. So they, sitting against the wall in the barn, fell into a heavy sleep, leaning against the wooden wall of the barn. And in the morning, with a creak, the door opened and the same gray-haired old man peeked in. Come out. How long can you sleep, he shouted loudly. The women obediently reached for the exit. The yard was wide and cleanly swept. There was a wide table in the middle, with a canopy over it. The house was of timber, and on the porch stood a woman of immense size. 
That's Willow, Olive guessed. Then the woman approached Olive and looked at her carefully. She's very weak, she said grudgingly to Caleb, she won't last long. Let her be like that, for now. We'll get another one later, he brushed her off, there's still a lot of work to be done. As long as the weather allows it, we'll have to put on more, so we'll have something to sell in winter. Right. Not in the house in winter, Willow nodded. They talked among themselves as if neither Leslie nor Olive understood them. And that made Olive feel even scarier. First you spin the yarn, and then I'll give you something to eat, Willow told them rudely, go under the shed. Leslie obediently went, but Olive remained standing still. Do you want a special invitation, Willow asked, her eyebrows furrowed in a threatening manner. I won't work for you, Olive said quietly, but firmly. Olive, what are you doing, and Leslie looked back frightened, come on. It'll be worse. Did you hear what your friend said, grinned Caleb, go or I'll fly you? I won't, Olive said, her head cocked. The next second she felt a whip, and then another, and another. Her eyes went black. Dizzy. Olive collapsed. Caleb, cursing, dragged her into the barn. Where did you bring such a pest from, cried Willow, she won't do any good, you'll see. She'll get used to it, replied the old man. Olive fell into a heavy sleep. She did not hear Caleb start his car and drive off somewhere. Willow was walking around the yard, all shouting at Leslie, and the river and the tall cedars were making noise nearby. At this time Josiah strolled into the little station, and from the few passersby he asked about a certain elder who was a healer. But no one knew of such a man, only shrugged their shoulders. He lives around here somewhere, Josiah explained in isolation. There are many of them, only people shrugged them off. But one woman suggested that Josiah was talking about an old man living with his wife in the mountains. But he doesn't heal. You've been told the wrong thing. He and his wife make souvenirs, things for tourists, she explained, of people, they don't talk to anyone. Baptist in a word. Josiah was seriously surprised. Well, they say they have a house behind a high fence. No one knows what's in there. They don't let anybody in. Though, they make good souvenirs, and very wonderful knit mittens and socks. Oh, there he is. The woman reached out her hand in the direction of an old car. A tall old man stepped out of there and leisurely headed toward a simple building with the loud name of an internet cafe. Josiah even grinned. The old man went to social networking. And then it hit him. He imagined that this way this grandfather could look for his so-called patients. The old man was a shady one. It was useless to talk to him. So Josiah decided on a little gamble. He waited until the old man came out of the cafe and, swaying slightly, moved toward him. Excuse me, are you the medicine man, he asked, and then he coughed. The old man looked at him carefully and remained silent, I read about you on the internet once. Help me. What's wrong with you, the old man finally said. Cancer. My lungs are sick. The doctors won't do anything anymore. They said two months and that's it. Two months, you say, the old man said something in his mind, well, let's go, I will help you in any way I can. At the car he handed Josiah a bottle. Josiah opened the cap and smelled it. Drink it. It's a tea. You'll feel better now, the old man smiled. Josiah took a sip and immediately shook himself, you look weak, the old man grumbled, you don't look it. He gave Josiah a gentle nudge on the seat. He fell into the cabin. Already lying on the seat, Josiah spit out the liquid, which he had not swallowed. Then he carefully, cautiously looked out the window, with one eye slightly ajar, watching the route. The old man didn't even turn around. Why should he? His potion worked without fail. They drove for a long time. At last they came to a house. The old man was explaining something, then the woman approvingly agreed, peered into the cabin. Wow. How strong. We should dig a new well. He should be able to handle it. It's huge. And you can't tell he's got cancer. 
Caleb, is he really sick? The hell he knows. I'll give him my decoction just in case. Just not in such concentrated form that he won't think, answered Caleb. Together they dragged Josiah to the barn, and they laughed on the way, that he would have a lot of fun resting with women. Has the new girl taken to her senses, asked Caleb. No. You shouldn't have brought her. That's okay, I'll bring her up again tomorrow. She'll work like a good girl. They threw Josiah in the corner of the barn and left. Josiah lay down for a while and opened his eyes. It was already dark in the barn. Through the hole in the roof the first stars were peeking through. Who are you, he heard a woman's husky voice. Olive, Josiah asked uncertainly. No. I'm Leslie. And Olive is asleep. She's had it today, poor thing. Where is she? Josiah jumped up from his seat. I'm here, came a faint voice, and who are you? Olive, it's me, Josiah. Josiah, the girl wondered, how are you here? Why? I've come for you, Olive. Josiah walked over to the lying girl and sat down beside her. In the starlight they looked at each other in confusion. How did you find me, whispered Olive, and then suddenly realized, and Declan. What about him? I left him for you. Don't worry. He's with his nanny, a very nice woman. But I don't understand how you got here. Oh, that's quite a story, and Josiah told Olive how he had gone to her village, how he had talked to Maya and Madeline, how he had looked for her, Olive, I suspected at once that you were mixed up with some charlatan. So I went looking for you. It's not even a charlatan, it's a slave owner, Olive answered him quietly, some kind of monster. And she gave a brief account of what was going on here. I'll have them tomorrow, replied Josiah, and, after a little hesitation, put his arm around Olive's shoulders lightly. You must be freezing, right? A little. Thank you. It's me who should thank you for my son. Olive, I didn't know anything at the time. Kayla lied to you. You really didn't know? Olive's voice trembled, and she herself trembled with truth. My God, you're freezing. Josiah hugged her tighter, Olive, we have a son. Olive didn't say anything back to him. She only snuggled into his shoulder. She thought she was dreaming. She was with someone she had never thought of before, and he was sitting there hugging her. Everything bad in her life seemed to have receded. And in the morning the door creaked open. Caleb looked into the barn. Why are you still asleep, he shouted sternly and immediately received a powerful punch to the jaw. It was Josiah who was guarding him against the wall. And you rest now, he said, and then he twisted the old man, tying him up with a rope, which just so happened to be on the wall in the barn. Willow came running at the noise. Josiah had to be a bit hard on her, she should not be beaten, she was a woman, after all. But soon the wife was beside her husband. Josiah strode around the yard, looking around, ignoring the shouting and screaming of the bound owners. In the house he found his bag with his documents, his phone. Except the phone was no use here, the cell phone didn't pick up. Olive and Leslie's papers were there, too. A dozen other passports, all female. Josiah felt goosebumps running down his body. What a bastard. They took advantage of the helplessness of sick people, squeezed the last juices out of them. You should be sentenced to life in prison for that. Okay, girls, he told Leslie and Olive, we're going to the nearest police station, and we're going to report these bastards. Let them find out what they've been up to. You go, Leslie whispered, and I'll stay. Leslie, what are you doing, Olive wondered. I don't feel well. I'm afraid I won't make it. Where am I gonna fit in there? You and Olive will both sit in the same seat in front, Josiah answered her, you need to go to the hospital right away, Leslie, he persuaded her. They placed the criminals in the back seat, and the three of them got in front and drove off, leaving the horrible yard in the past. True at first, they listened to Willow and Caleb screaming, cursing, pleading, but Josiah promised to shut their mouths. Then they kept quiet. 
There was a police office at the same station. That's where Josiah took Willow and Caleb. The policeman could not believe for a long time that the information he had heard was true. But Leslie and Olive confirmed it. The lash marks on Olive's body spoke for themselves. Then Leslie became quite ill and an ambulance came to take her away. She said, goodbye, to Olive. They would probably never see each other again. Olive looked thoughtfully after the ambulance took Leslie away. Yes, I won't see you in this world. But we won't see each other in this one, she said suddenly aloud. Why are you suddenly going to the next world? Josiah asked playfully. Josiah, I am ill. I have written to you about it. And your mother must have told you, if you were here. Yes, I know all that. But, Olive, yesterday I did not tell you the main thing, I found a doctor who undertakes to help you, exclaimed Josiah we must urgently go to the capital. To be honest, I do not believe it. I have heard so much from doctors. I can't be helped. And I say you can, Josiah exclaimed with a little anger, Olive, at least this is a real chance. Or do you want to look for some charlatan again? No, I certainly won't survive a second Caleb, Olive smiled sadly and nodded in agreement, let's go to the capital. At least maybe I'll see my son. Kayla, meanwhile, was settling into her former home. In less than a day, she began to shout at the servants, with Samantha at all fought. Why did you make that damn soup? Those cutlets and potatoes? It's all so caloric and unhealthy, she shouted when she saw what she was about to be fed for lunch. If you don't like it, don't eat it, replied the cook, but Declan really likes it. Really? Little Declan, who was already happily eating the soup, smiled contentedly. Yes. Just like grandma's. Live with your grandmother, then, and Kayla left the table without eating her lunch. Wicked aunt, the boy whispered quietly. Yes, she's mean and a viper, Samantha winked at him, and you eat, kid. Declan, don't bang your spoon, reminded Lexi. And everyone went on with their lunch. Everyone pretended that Kayla wasn't bothering them at all, though in the 24 hours she had been here, she had annoyed everyone. Especially Kyra, whom Josiah's ex-wife wanted to make her ally, but Skye is not a stupid girl. She's seen Kayla act like the ground is on fire under her feet, running into this house like a beaten dog and acting like she's the missus. No, honey, your time is over. And Kayla, locked in her room, thought over her next steps. Yes, we need to make contact with the boy. Otherwise he looks like a wolf. Though Kayla can barely tolerate him. He had to show up. And when is Josiah coming? He never returns her calls. Josiah and Olive arrived in the capital toward evening. Olive was weak after the flight and the events she had undergone. Josiah decided to take her immediately to the clinic and called Kaysen. You've found the runaway, then, said the doctor with a sniffle, of course, take her. The sooner we work with her, the better the chances of a happy outcome. Olive fainted in the cab, and Josiah carried her into the clinic in his arms. Dash, save her, he pleaded with Kaysen, she's so young. She has two children. She must live. I'll do what I can, the doctor nodded dryly, and you go home. You have no face on you. And the payment? We'll settle everything tomorrow, the doctor literally forced Josiah out of the clinic. Olive was taken to the examination room. Now she was being attended to by top-notch specialists. She was almost in God's hands, Kaysen had pulled so many people from the death and he would save her. Eh, Olive, if then, coming to the office, you and Declan had stayed and waited for me, explained everything. There wouldn't be what there is now, Josiah reasoned to himself, sitting in the cab, this awful trip, meeting a crazy old man has taken even more of your strength. But you hang in there, girl, hang in there. Your children and I need you. Josiah froze in his thoughts. Yes, in the short time he had been with Olive, Josiah had realized how much he cared for her. He could still feel her frail shoulders under his palms, feel her soft, silky hair touching his cheek, and his heart sank. 
That night in the barn, when Olive slept on his shoulder, was something of a revelation. She was so defenseless, and only he could shelter her from all adversity. Only if they were not too late. Only if Kaysen would help her. A guard met him in the courtyard of the mansion. When he saw his master, he was a little embarrassed. Josiah, here's the thing, he was quiet for a moment. What else happened, Josiah asked tiredly, I let Kayla into the house. She came in looking as if they'd made up. You didn't say anything about letting her in or not. Where is she now, frowned Josiah. In the house. Sky told me she's acting there like you're not even divorced. I mean, she's a hostess. Amazing, Josiah hummed, okay, Alfred, you relax. It's all right. And he went, leaving the guard to puzzle. Josiah looked in on Declan first thing. He and the babysitter were looking at a children's magazine. Hello, the boy exclaimed cheerfully and ran up to Josiah, you're back. Did you find your mother? When are we going to Grandma and Maya's? The little boy just kept asking questions. Josiah laughed. I don't know what to answer. Okay, so tomorrow you and I are going to go visit mom in the hospital, and then I'm going to take you to Grandma Madeline and Maya's. I miss them a lot, the boy admitted, but my mom the most. You're my good one. Don't worry, we'll see you tomorrow. Come here, I'll hug you, Josiah took the boy, then he lifted him a little, listen, why, you, as if I was a stranger's uncle? I'm your own man. I'm your daddy. The boy trustingly put his arms around his neck. The touch of those little hands made Josiah's heart beat faster. Yes, he is daddy. Josiah. I don't understand, Lexi broke their idol, so you don't need my services anymore? Did I understand correctly that the boy will be leaving tomorrow? He'll leave here for a while, but he'll definitely be back later, Josiah smiled at the older woman. I hope that you and I will continue to have a business relationship. All right, I don't mind. Declan's a wonderful kid. They talked some more. Josiah put his son to bed. As Lexi was leaving the boy's bedroom, Kayla appeared in the hallway. She already knew that Josiah had arrived, and she was very much looking forward to seeing him. Kayla thought that Josiah would be surprised, maybe angry at first, but she would manage to extinguish his anger. After all, there had been such love between them before. It couldn't have disappeared without a trace. Josiah came out of the bedroom. Kayla was standing by the stairs, all confused, like a beaten dog. Hello, Josiah, she said in a trembling voice, I called you many times. Then I came. I need to talk to you. I saw your incoming calls, but I couldn't get through to you. You came, so you set up in my house right away. Josiah grinned, you have your own apartment. What do you want? Josiah, you're mad at me, and you're right, a thousand times right. I made so many mistakes. And just now I realize that I cannot without you. Josiah, forgive me for everything. I love you. Really? Josiah shook his head with a chuckle. Josiah, I know you've been looking for me. So you're thinking of me, haven't forgotten and I can't. That's enough, said Josiah sternly, and immediately lowered his tone so as not to wake Declan, enough of this comedy. You know very well that it's over between us, and for a long time. But you know, it's even good that you came here yourself. Now you're going to explain everything to me. He grabbed Kayla by the arm and dragged her into the study. There Kayla continued to play the unhappy lover. Josiah, I felt so bad without you, without our home. Honey, don't send me away, we've been together so many years. And for so many years I was blind. It's not true. It's all lies. There are many envious of our happiness. And you believed it, Josiah? I love only you. Josiah sat back in his chair and looked at his ex-wife. She was crying, clutching her heart. And I just now realized what a terrible actress you are. He said, and how did I not notice it before? All right, that's enough. Now I want you to explain. How is it that Olive is alive? 
You were the one who delivered her body. Olive A. Kayla furrowed her brow, oh, the one. Well, I did what I had to do, I paid the men from the ritual shop, and they took her back to her home village. Is it my fault if I made a mistake when identifying her? You remember what was left of the body, don't you? Yes, it's a strange story. She's alive, and that boy in your house is our son? Josiah, she's a criminal. She should be prosecuted. Not only did she break the contract five years ago and run away with our child, but she framed some other poor woman. Maybe she killed her and set her car on fire. And now she shows up at your house. She obviously wants something from you. We have to call the police right away. She's a criminal. I'll call the police. I just wanted to hear the truth first, not the story you're trying to tell, he walked over to his ex-wife and grabbed her arm. Either you tell me everything, and then I'll let you go, or I'll call the police and file a report. Let them handle it. Now I'll supervise the investigation myself, and I assure you, you'll go to jail for a long time. But it's not my fault, said Kayla pitifully. It's not your fault? Let's start with the fact that you bribed the doctors when you implanted the embryo. Kayla's face changed. She hissed, and then she looked up and said, of course she did, what else could I do? The doctors rejected all my eggs. And here's this fool, who would do anything to save her daughter. And everything was going fine until you started looking at that olive girl. I saw the way you looked at her, I had to get rid of her. I told her the truth. I knew she couldn't give up her baby. The calculation was right here. Where did the woman's corpse in the car come from? Kayla sighed heavily, pondered, walked across the room, thinking about something, then stopped and looked at Josiah with hatred. How I hate you, she said quietly. Now you're telling the truth at last. All this talk about love, said Josiah sarcastically. You've been talking about the baby all your life, Kayla continued, ignoring his tone. She was already talking, and there was no stopping her. Her anger was pouring out of her, a baby. What do I need this snotty puppy for? Especially, it is from another woman. Then I put Olive on the train, her passport was stolen after the documents were checked. This fool went away happy, that now with the child will stay. And I had to act. You ruined a man, Josiah looked at his ex-wife in horror. Have you lost your mind? A Kayla chuckled nervously, why would I do that when I have billets? The day before I spent Olive, I found a matching corpse in one of the morgues. Some bum had been hit by a car. The corpse was unclaimed. For a small fee, I managed everything, and gave the cab driver so much money that he then went somewhere to rest at sea. I set up the accident. You couldn't have done it yourself at all. Did you have accomplices? Kayla lowered her eyes. Admitting to her ex-husband that she was having an affair with a police general at the time was beyond her strength. The general had helped her well at the time, gave her the people who had arranged everything. He explained to the investigator what to do and how to do it. The general even saw to it that the unknown woman was buried in the nearest cemetery. It worked out without any problems. He was a good man, but he died a year after the whole story. Kayla even cried a little at the time, and then she forgot. Who helped you, Josiah raised his voice. He's not alive anymore, Kayla admitted. Josiah only shook his head. In fact, he knew everything and knew every detail. He didn't need them. He had already guessed something like that, though, and now he knew for sure. I don't understand one thing, he said at last, why have you come to my house now? Aren't you ashamed to look me in the eye? And my son? Josiah, I'm willing to kneel as long as you say. Forgive me. After all, at the end of the day, I did everything for our love. You did everything for my money, answered Josiah sharply, and at the same time you did not forget to sleep with other men. Here's the deal. Get out of my house. And do not let me see you within a radius of five kilometers. Understand? Josiah, how can you do this, cried Kayla again, don't make decisions on emotion. Think about it. We used to be good together. Until I found out about your cheating. 
Do you really think I can forgive you for the olive thing? You took away five years of my time with my son. Get out. If you don't leave now, I'll call the police. And then I'll definitely report you. I have no money, whispered Kayla, nothing at all. And what can I do to help, grinned Josiah, thank God you're free. Go away for good. I forgive you, but don't think you will. If you come after me or my son or Olive. Olive? So there is something between you. Am I mistaken, exclaimed Kayla, flashing her eyes angrily. And that's none of your business. And once again I warn you, do not interfere with us again. So Kayla left Josiah's mansion that night. Soon Kayla sold her apartment and left. No one ever saw her again. Josiah didn't dwell on the past. It was too tiresome. Let the past remain in the past. The next day Josiah and Declan went to see Olive. She was lying in a separate room, she had regained consciousness, she was being prepared for surgery. Despite her weakness, Olive tried to pull herself up on the bed when she saw her son. My baby boy, she spoke softly, barely able to hold back her tears. Mommy, he exclaimed, ran happily to the bed, and immediately, like an adult, shifted his eyebrows, Mommy, you lie down. You need to save your strength. Daddy said you're going to need it. Daddy, Olive smiled through her tears and hugged her boy, then looked at Josiah. He stood beside her and tried to smile, believing that everything would work out for them, thank you, she whispered to Olive, I realized that everything in this clinic is very expensive. Don't even think about it. Don't even think about it, thank you, Josiah answered and sat down on the chair next to him, don't you worry about a thing. I will go to your mother and daughter with Declan tonight. We'll check on them. Daddy, you said you'd take me to them, the boy didn't understand. Of course I will, but just for a while. And then I'll take you all back to my place. We'll just get my mother fixed up. Josiah, let's not get that far ahead of ourselves, Olive touched his arm. Her fingers trembled, the only thing I want to ask. If anything, you take care of Declan and Maya, please. I know I have no right to ask, but my little girl, if anything happens to Mama, has no one else in the world. I told you we're all together now, Josiah answered her seriously, and don't think of anything bad. The doctor said everything will be all right. Olive only nodded weakly in response. In fact, Kaysen did not give any favorable prognosis. He refused to talk about it at all. Everything would be clear during the operation. Josiah only stopped by the office that day, and then went with you to a distant village. Josiah decided that, for the duration of the operation, the boy would be with his own grandmother. And then we will see what to do next. Declan sat behind Josiah most of the way and looked out the window enthusiastically. For the boy it was his first such long car trip. And by evening, when they stopped at a roadside hotel, he just lay down on the bed and immediately fell asleep. Josiah lay down beside him, carefully covering the boy with a blanket. Sleep, son, he whispered. In the morning they set out again. They were in the village by dinner time. Josiah almost passed Madeline's house, didn't recognize him simply. And Declan didn't recognize it either, only by the apple tree in the orchard and determined. Where's our house? the boy asked fearfully. And this is it. Only it has been repaired, laughed Josiah, looking at the work of the construction crew with pleasure. The builders had fixed the roof, put in plastic windows, clad the house, and fixed the foundation. The same old barn that loomed menacingly in the back of the homestead was gone. In its place was a small outbuilding. Everything was in place and to the point. Now Josiah and Declan got out of the car. Maya ran out of the house, followed by Grandma Madeline, leaning on her cane. Oh, and my favorite grandson has arrived, the old lady exclaimed, Declan. The boy shone with a smile and rushed to his grandmother, to his little sister. They hugged each other, saying something to each other. Josiah stood beside them and smiled. How good it is when relatives are together. Yes, he could not tear Declan away from Maya and Madeline, even if something happened to Olive. And immediately corrected himself mentally, Olive would be fine. 
Later, they were in the kitchen drinking tea and talking. Madeline at length thanked Josiah. Now her house was like a toy, the envy of all the neighbors. The builders wanted to rebuild the stove, but I wouldn't let them, it's getting cold. And while they are doing their work, should we live in the cold? They are going to leave dirt behind. I have a good stove, the old lady said, it will keep us warm for about five years. Let it stay that way for now. And next year you need gas. I see you have a pipe in the garden. Yes, but it just runs through it. It's very expensive to put gas in the house. Don't worry about that. They were quiet. And as the brother and sister fled into the room, the elderly woman asked her main question, with anxiety and trepidation in her voice, how her daughter was doing. Josiah didn't go into detail about the trip. He only mentioned that he found her quickly and had a serious talk with her. Said she needed to be treated by the right doctors. That's what you said, Grandma Madeline said, wiping away her tears. Will the doctors help? The operation will be one of these days. In the meantime, we have to do some tests and prepare ourselves. Madeline, can Declan stay with you for a while? I have work to do. He's fine with us, but he's better off with you. You ask, the old woman spluttered, Declan is my own grandson. I always feel better with him. My heart wasn't in the right place, and now I'm ready to sing songs. My dearest ones are with me. I wish Olive would get better. Let's hope so, Josiah nodded. He left, promising to come back soon. Madeline, after seeing him off and putting him to bed for the night, stood by the icon of Nicholas the Wonderworker for a long time and prayed silently. The words were unintelligible. But what for are they needed, when a prayer comes from the heart? The elderly woman was thankful that her stubborn daughter had been found, that she had agreed to the treatment. Madeline asked for one thing, to give strength to her olive. She also asked for a little miracle, may that illness not seem so terrible. Surgery was scheduled for Friday. Kaysen personally called Josiah to let her know. Now all that was left to do was wait, but the phone was silent. Things weren't working out. Josiah sat and waited. Ariel saw the tension of the chief, tried to distract him somehow, make some tea, or coffee. Ariel, I'm going to have your coffee coming out of my ears, Josiah said suddenly and pitifully. Oh, I'm sorry, said Ariel frightenedly, I can just see that you're not finding yourselves. Yes, you're right. And why is it taking so long to do this operation? It will be all right. You'll see. Ariel smiled encouragingly. Of course, no one knew anything for sure, but everyone was hopeful. By the way, the office knew the whole Josiah and Olive story from somewhere. Who? No one gave it a second thought. Ariel continued to communicate well with Lexi, the very nanny, but she had a big secret and told the story she had witnessed by chance. She didn't know the details, but there was enough information. Josiah's main ex-wife spent her husband, chased away the surrogate mother, who turned out to be the birth mother. Such a complicated story. It seemed that the subordinates in the office were really worried about Olive. After all, it was she and her boy who gave them back a normal boss. Otherwise, Josiah had turned into a robot lately. Finally, the clinic called. Kaysen said tiredly that everything had gone well, the tumor had been taken for histology. The first analysis showed that it was benign, but we still have to study it carefully. It's large and would have had a negative impact on the patient's body anyway if not for this surgery. Now what? asked Josiah fearfully. Now prepare yourself, young man. I think you have a big change ahead of you, Kaysen said with a smile. Josiah thanked and hung up. Did it really work out? Then the phone rang again. It was the call from the genetics clinic. We sent you the results of the tests in the mail, said a pleasant female voice, you can look at them. Young lady, can you say it in your own words, asked Josiah. Basically, he hadn't cared for a long time what the examination would show. In your own words, you are the boy's biological father. And the second test? The girl and the boy are related to each other. 
Thank you, Josiah thanked, then smiled and shrugged. He already knew all that. The new year was only a couple of days away. At last Olive was able to leave the clinic. She was still weak, pale, but most importantly, she was healthy. Yes, she had been through a lot. And even if now her head only grew hair that looked like a hedgehog, even if she still felt occasionally dizzy and nauseous, the doctor explained that it was normal. It would pass. Declan, Mia, and Josiah hurried toward her with a huge bouquet of flowers. They laughed, hugged Olive, and they were all one family. Not long ago Josiah moved the children and Madeline to the city, Maya now goes to a prestigious high school. Declan goes to kindergarten, Madeline treats her joints with famous doctors. They all live together in the Josiah mansion, waiting for Olive to finally be discharged. Mommy, we put up such a wonderful Christmas tree, said Declan excitedly, it's so huge. Yes. It's standing in the yard, Maya added, we thought it would be better. Dad suggested it. It's great, isn't it? It makes the tree come alive and makes everyone feel good. Also, Daddy bought us a Labrador puppy, Declan continued to boast. What a wonderful daddy we have, smiled Olive, he's the best, and she stepped toward Josiah, looked him in the eyes. Could I ever have even dreamed that one day I would meet such a wonderful man as you, Josiah? You are a real magician. Thank you. I'm still just learning, Josiah smiled, oh, by the way, you owe me something else. What, confused Olive. You haven't answered me yet, will you marry me? Olive put her head on his shoulder and said softly, You are my most beloved and best man. And you are the only I want to be with for the rest of my life. Of course, I agree to be your wife. An amazing story, isn't it? Thank you for listening till the end. I sincerely hope that you truly enjoyed it. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and rate this video. See you in the comments and in new releases.